you can have it. You can say, what's my hobby? My hobby is to play the piano. Well, how about you go to the piano and you have a little more acoustic piano and you start playing it. And you can see why it's the biggest piece of music that's out there that's World War II. And then the other topic is um, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm just finishing a book on, if you guys are in, ever interested in World War II stuff, uh, I wonder if I brought it with me. I did not. I remember I pulled it out. Um, but it's called, what's it called? Um, I can't remember what it's called. That's how good it is. Spearhead. It's called Spearhead. Anybody ever read Spearhead? It's uh, a book about, so you have the uh, easy company that Band of Brothers was built off of. This is a tank company that uh, was heavily involved in World War II and it's a New York Times bestseller and really, really well written, really well done, just about how the tanks that they drove, those Sherman tanks were just, you know, they they were so inferior to the German Panzer tank and then the Tiger tank, you know, and uh, how they had to fight battles and the lead tank always got hit, but it's a story of their lives and so I always find that kind of stuff and death, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because a uh, shell could penetrate right through them, no problem at all. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's what we're going to look at today. We ask ourselves the question, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? So uh, first of all, there are scrolls that contain ancient manuscripts. And can you see that okay? This is the area where they found them. It's called Qumran is the area where they found them. And the question is, is who wrote them? And what is so significant about the writing of them? So you have the Dead Sea located there, and then you have up at the top there, Qumran. That is where they found it, and it's about eight hours by foot uh, to Jerusalem. But uh, that's going to play into a key role. So you can see uh, Jerusalem way over here on this side of your screen, and then you can see where Qumran is over here by the top of the Dead Sea. And uh, that's where they found them. So Jerusalem here, and then Qumran is the next one over. So they were found in these limestone cave cliffs, and um, they were found in a plateau uh, up in the hills. So this is a little bit of what, if you were looking at it from more of a bird's eye view, you've got limestone cliffs, you've got the wadi, Qumran. A wadi is just uh, the valley. When you have two hills and then the valley comes together, they call that a wadi. And so when it rains, all the water goes into the wadi. And uh, you have the different caves here, the plateau for Qumran where they lived. And then you'll see below it these caves where they hid everything and stored everything. There's a total, yeah. Uh, where did you see that? Yeah, in Marl Caves, yeah. Um, somebody Google that. I, I think it has to do with the limestone or the softness of the cave. Um, M-A-R-L. Okay. 931 documents, as I said. Oldest copies of the New Testament, or Old Testament, I should say, no New Testament copies. And Jewish sectarian writings. So out of these 931 documents, you can divide them into about a third, third, and a third. A third were biblical texts containing books of the Old Testament. Every book of the Old Testament we do have a scroll on, except for the book of Esther. That's the only one that we do not have that was not found in that collection. Um, the other documents, because Qumran was a sectarian branch of Judaism that lived far over to the uh, near the Dead Sea, away from Jerusalem, they believe that they broke away began to live there because they didn't agree with everything that was going on within the temple, the way they practiced, the way they worshipped, and some of the things that they did. So a marl is what? A crumbly mixture of clay, calcium, magnesium, carbonates, and remnants of shells that somehow found under desert sands. So it's a... It's a former what? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And um, it, ideal for making pottery, by the way, because <clears throat> that's what Qumran was used for, was making a lot of pottery. The, they're found in three different writings, uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And people say, can you read Greek? Yes. Can you read Hebrew? Yes. Aramaic, not so good. 
but the Hebrew that it was written in, it, the problem is it's Hebrew, like all languages, have developed, and it's Paleo-Hebrew. So there's early Paleo, there's mid-Paleo, and there's late Paleo-Hebrew, and then there's biblical Masoretic text, and then there's modern-day Hebrew. So the alphabets all look a little different. So I was on vacation this year. I was trying to familiarize myself with the uh, early, mid, and late Paleo alphabet so I could read a little bit better. Um, so if you were to walk in to, to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, a, a modern-day Hebrew today could not read it, and you you know even if you knew Hebrew, uh, you wouldn't be able to read it unless you were familiar with those alphabets. Um, it's interesting is that these scrolls were produced before uh, 250 BCE. That's before Common Air. That's the current way they they say it. We just used to say BC and AD, and 68. Uh, what we would have said A.D., but now called Common Air. And uh, they were hidden in these caves. So, well, that's a one thought. People say that because A.D. after death and and uh, uh, B.C. before Christ. Common Air, Air, yeah. So, yeah. And, and I don't know why they do that. Maybe they do that so they don't have to reference that. I'm I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> You never know, right? Uh, they're considered one of the greatest dis manuscript discoveries of modern times. They really are spectacular. So in 1940, what happened is these Bedouin uh, goat herders were in the Judean wilderness in this particular area, and they stumbled upon caves. Um, and how they stumbled upon them, there's 11 caves <coughs> total. Here are the two guys that discovered them. That, of course, they were boys at the time. This is taken subsequent to that. But um, as a shepherd boy uh, herding goats, he had lost his goats. This would have been in the 1940s <clears throat> up in this cave area that he saw here. The goat had gone in there, obviously, to get some shade and whatever. And he threw a rock into this upper cave. And when he did, <clears throat> it scared the goat out of the cave. But he heard, after he threw the rock in, the breaking of some pottery. So that immediately kind of was an alarm. So he peered into the cave and uh, saw shapes that were in the darkness. And he lowered himself through the cave opening and found scrolls, scores of jar or scroll jars lying on the floor of the cave. And I'll show you what one of those looks like. So he's pointing here to what it was like. <clears throat> so these scroll jars were arranged together along the cave wall. This is what the jars look like that were actually, the jars were actually made in Qumran. Um, I didn't realize this, but <clears throat> every soil or clay has a un uh, very unique code or DNA to where it is. In other words, if you have some dirt, you can basically tell where that dirt is from by an analysis of the dirt. And what is interesting is they took scrapings from these particular pieces of pottery. And when they break up, they're called pot sheards. They're just little tiny pieces of fragments everywhere. And if you go into Israel and you go anywhere, you're going to see pot sheared everywhere. I remember I was at the beach in Ashkelon, and I was just sitting there. And you've got this beautiful beach with all these little red specks in it. And that's what that is, pottery that had been broken. And I was sitting there with my buddies, and we were just relaxing uh, the day. And I started to push my feet in the sand. I was sitting in a chair, and all of a sudden, this bump comes up. And I reached down there, and I pulled it out. <clears throat> and I pulled out a piece of Byzantine pottery uh, from the 3rd century. And it was just sitting there painted. It was that really a, an actual pretty nice piece. And I should have brought it, but I didn't. Um, and I thought, oh, my gosh, what have I discovered here, you know? And I asked my professor, and he says, well, just go hide that. And I said, well, should I turn it in? He goes, dude, if you knew how many warehouses of stuff that we have just like that. And he says, that's a Byzantine period pottery, quite common. It's really of no value. Just, you know, push it in your sock and take it home. So I put it in my sock and take it home. And I didn't think about it till I got at the air airport. And I thought, am I committing a crime here? Am I? <laughs> so it came home with me. They never checked it, but I sure that I was going to end up in prison or something like that. Maybe I, after a guilty conscience, I'll take it back one of these days next time I go there. But um, this Bedouin counted 37 scrolls and removed at least seven of the scrolls. 
Uh, it wasn't until later on, a couple of years later, that relatives said to him, because a, a Bedouin herder is a guy who moves all around, right? He doesn't stay in one location, like the life of Abraham. He was a Bedouin. He just moved from pieces of land and property to all through the promised land. So they said, yeah, you ought to take it in and, and uh, get it assessed, see if it's worth anything. And they did. They took it to a Bethlehem guy who was a cobbler and also an antiques dealer. He's a member of the Syrian Orthodox Church. His last name is Kondo, Mr. Kondo. And um, they uh, they took him there, and um, th- they, he explained to them where he found them and how he found them and everything that took place. Here's a picture of the guy with the scroll jars in his shop, and this is in the 1950s. Not a great picture of him, but nevertheless, it's he's dead now. But you can see all the little pieces of pottery and stuff that they find along the way that they sell to tourists coming in. And there's, of course, there's always a good story that goes with the piece of pottery that you bought, you know. Oh, that piece of pottery, I can't sell you that one. That was used by the Emperor Nero back in whatever. It's worth millions of dollars, but I'll give it to you for 1995. Special deal only today. But they're always trying to sell you something. So he sold four scrolls to the Orthodox Church. And uh, the man by Mar Mar Samuel let John Trevor of the Albright Institute photograph him. So here they're found in the in the early 40s. They begin to discover what they have through selling it. And this guy from the Albright Institute comes and he's actually allowed to photographer them to actually photo them. And then three of those scrolls were sold to the Hebrew University. So there's Mar Samuel, he's the owner of the shop, and John Trevor, he's come out from the uh, university to be able to take a look at that. And uh, the four scrolls were on display for the first time at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. in 1949. Now, now understand this, though the scrolls are on display and they realize they're ancient in nature, they don't really understand fully what they have scholarly research hasn't yet begun on it. And so picture, I'll show you some fragmentations of scrolls, but picture you walking in to a room that's a jigsaw puzzle that is several inches deep with pieces of the puzzle and it's all over the floor. And you have no box, you have no picture on the box, you have no idea how they all fit together and some of the puzzle pieces belong to different parts of the puzzle. That's how difficult this is when you have hundreds of thousands of little pieces to try to put them back together. So it becomes a monumental task. But uh, in 1951, they began to do real serious excavation of the area. And in uh, 1952, caves four, five, and six were discovered. Now they have a total of 11 caves. So they just got the tip of the iceberg, and now they're really beginning to do it. And a Bedouin sells the scrolls to a Jordanian institute. Uh, 15,000 fragments is what he found from Cave 4 for 842,000 dinar, which is uh, Jordanian money. Is anybody, you can Google that and check out how much that is. I used to, $12, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then they recover more than 40,000 scroll fragments from the floor in K4. So as they begin to see how many fragments they find, uh, two and halves of a copper scroll that they found, and they cut it into sections. Here's the copper scroll. So they actually had text of uh, sc- the scroll written on copper. Now, h- how do you unroll the copper? How do you unfurl it? to be able to get to it, and they were not able to do that. So as you can see in the top screen here, they cut it into fragments. Now, Scripture wasn't located on it, but it was written as a uh, kind of a treasure map. It says, The ruin in which this valley passed under the steps leading to the east, four cubits, there is a chest of money, (laughs) a total weight of 17 talents, right? Uh, the sepulchre monument in the third course, a hundred gold ingots. And if you just go through, so it was kind of written to tell people where the buried treasure was. And of course, they've looked everywhere and they've not found it. They think it may have been somewhat of a hoax, but they're not really sure because someday they could be dig- digging along and somebody would find it. 
So the discovery of it is pretty interesting, but you can begin to see these are little fragments there, and this is what it was like when you walked into the cave, just tiny little pieces of leather, because what the scrolls were written on were parchment and vellum. That's animal skins. A parchment is a rougher, untied, uh, not dyed animal skin, and a parchment or vellum is an animal skin that is stretched and thinner and more work goes into it. If you were to do a scroll and put it on a flat piece of uh, table, it would take about 350 skins of animals to comprise and to make one scroll. So it's pretty uh, time intensive and very, very expensive to do. One of the things that they discovered along the way, and this is kind of cool because they found areas where there were just piles of bones. And they were able to take those bones and do DNA sample on those bones. They were goat bones. They were sheep bones, Ibanex bones. And they were to take these bones that they discovered and they could actually take the material from the bone, the DNA, and they could actually m match it to the scroll. And they know that bone went to this animal who was made up of this section of the scroll, which is pretty intense to be able to do that. But there is so much work that has to be done on this. It is just uh, unbelievable to think about it. But in 54, John D. Rockefeller agreed to fund the scroll research for six years. And uh, the scrolls that were left, uh, Mar Samuel advertised them in the Wall Street Journal. And they were bought on proxy on behalf of the state of Israel for $250,000. Don't you wish you were alive in 54? Well, some of you were, but don't you wish you had $250,000 because you'd be independently wealthy now? And so they also use this to build and to house uh, a place to keep the scrolls. That's part of the museum. So uh, here's the actual original ad in the Wall Street Journal. Biblical manuscripts dating back to at least... 200 BC are for sale. <laughs> it would be an ideal gift to any pastor, no, to an educational or religious institution or an individual or a group. And they, that's how they sold them. So, and when Israel found out that it was there, they decided to purchase it. So they're exhibited now in this place called the Shrine of the Book. So that's the roof of the Shrine of the Book. It looks like the top of a scroll, doesn't it? And then the building goes down, and then you can see it's an interior shot of the actual, that black thing that looks almost like a spinning top. There's glass around it, and you can stand and walk around it because the whole book of Isaiah is right there for anyone to read. It's truly amazing to sit there and walk right there and look at it. Of course, you need to know the alphabet to do that, but nevertheless, you can see it and know it. So they search the areas for other scrolls and yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah you can actually buy online a dead sea scroll bible so where they've translated it and and most of my work has been done in that area where they have translated it because it doesn't come with what we call vowel pointing so in in hebrew language um when you when you're writing the letters of course you're going a, a different way when you're uh writing the hebrew alphabet and you'll have under here different, uh, what we call vowel pointing. So there'll be a, a Siri, there'll be a Pathak, um, there'll be uh, all kinds of different uh, vowel pointing. This was done by the Masoretes later on in the ninth century to help us because the Hebrew alphabet is all consonants. So if you were to open up your Bible to Psalm 119, you will see 22 different sections each beginning with a letter of the Hebrew Bible, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Hei, Wow, Zion, Cheth, Teth, Yo, all the way down to the end, uh, Sin, Shin. And that would all have different uh, uh, consonants. And then because when they wrote Hebrew, they did not write vowels out. The Masoretes did something very important, knowing how the language was spoken and used. They then came along and put in vowels to help us understand. So, so if I was to write in, uh, let's just say I'm going to use the same thing over into English. If I was to write the word LK, 
what would what would what word would that be? Well, it could be a number of words, couldn't it? But let's say I was writing the word look, so I, I would not have the vowels placed in there. So what they would do is they would come along and they would add a, a significant marking in there to be able for us to understand how to properly read it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So, you know, my, my name is Mike. M is a consonant, I is a vowel, K is a consonant, E is a vowel. So that would be my name. And they would put under here, you know, different types of valve pointing to make me read that to say, okay, that means Mike. But that's not how they did it back in the day. Back in the day, they didn't have valve pointing. So this was helpful to me and helpful for us to be able to understand how they how they wrote it. And so, you know, like the very first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, right? And just kind of looks like an, an X. It's not a very good Aleph. But and then later on, in the Paleo Hebrew alphabet, this was the letter A. Um, that was the letter A. So pretty different, huh? But the letter A meant, believe it of all things, calf or bull. Well, you could t almost look at this and think that that could be a calf, right? Give him a couple eyes, smiley face and a nose, <laughs> right? So in, in one sense, the, the way the alphabet worked was a little bit to try to help you through pictures, and it just evolves from there, and then it becomes how you, how you write. So interesting study if you ever want to do that on language, because language does not stay the same. It's always changing. Yes, sir. You've had you've had your one allotted question. That's all. <laughs> well, the vowel that you would just learn it by just reading it, and you would supply the vowels as you go, so and there through are oral sounds, but there are no vowel letters. Right through oral tradition. That's kind of how it was kept. That's pretty amazing to think about that, but that's just how their language worked, 22 different consonants. I don't know. I, I, I have no idea why, but they, that's how you learn it. And so if you were to go to a script today that was an older script, it would just have the consonants, and it would not have the valve pointing. Now, in my Hebrew Bible, it's called the Biblical Hebraica Stuttgartensia. It was done in Germany. It, you open it up and it has all the valve pointing there. So what they've been able to do is take the Dead Sea Scrolls written in Paleo Hebrew and translate them over into a more modern day form of Hebrew so that we could understand and read it better. So I, so I can, so guys like me who know one form of a language but not the alphabet of the other. So, but you know, and how they do that is via computer, which is pretty cool. They, they've been able to do so much. So you got to remember this is in the 50s and the 60s when all this is coming about. We don't have any computers. We don't have any high resolution photography. We don't have the ability to do that. The things that they're able to do today is quite amazing. In fact, in these little fragments that they found on the ground that just look like little pieces of leather were so dark you could not tell what was written on any of those fragments. So a guy from JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Pasadena, uh, was able to subject some of these fragmentations to uh, this special light that they use there at JP, uh, JPL for determining and photographing the surfaces of the earth. And they were able to lift it up so that when actually you're looking at it, it you can actually read the writing. As, as before, you never could read the writing, but now you could see it clearly and you can read it, which is pretty amazing to think about. In fact, in that process of doing that, that's how they caught fraud, uh, Dead Sea Scroll uh, pieces that were fraudulently done and sold on the open market. So take, for instance, uh, how many of you ever heard of Hobby Lobby? So Hobby Lobby... Uh, bought a bunch of Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts and um, looking for a scrap piece of paper that I could use here. And they bought these manuscripts and in the purchasing of these manuscripts, they were told that they were genuine and real. 
I don't know what they paid, but they paid a lot of money. And they ended up in the Museum of the Bible. And then through this light technology and other things, they're able to take an edge of a piece of paper and they're able to magnify it so intensely that it, it looks, you know, like a, this big to the, to, on the photo. So they can, they can magnify it. And if it's like this where there's writing on there, okay, and I was to take this text here and I was to rip the paper in half, you would notice that this portion of it here is nice and white. This is over here is really frayed, right? And you can't, you know, you can tell where it was torn, but it was, it's also frayed. And it isn't until you put the two together that you can really begin to understand what is being said. So on these fake pieces of manuscript, somebody had tore leather and cut it up and then wrote on top. And as they wrote on top, they also wrote on this thin edge over here. And the alphabet would go all the way to here. Well, as you can see, the alphabet, had it been torn, would not go over there. They call this waterfalling. And so they were able to magnify it through intensity, light, and to be able to blow it up to discover that these fragments that they had all had writing on this portion, which should not have had writing. And they were able to determine that they were fraudulent. What somebody had done is they went over there to a uh, site, an, an excavation, where they're digging up, uh, what they call them a tell, uh, to try to find different pieces of archaeological evidence, and they find old, an old leather shoe. Well, you know, they've got thousands and thousands of those. They don't need another old leather shoe. So somebody comes up with the idea, let's take that old leather shoe because it's really old leather, and let's cut it up. And then let's put some Hebrew letters on there and then sell it as fragments of the Dead Sea Scroll. So uh, the guys from Hobby Lobby got took on that and get donated them to the Museum of the Bible. And I don't know if they're still there now where they've removed them, but uh, kind of sad to do that. Yeah, this is it, man. You're, you're, on, you're on your third question. <laughs> Yes. Qumran. Just the general area. And they're not only able to do that, they took one scroll called the Thanksgiving scroll, and they were able to take some of the ink off of there. And they were able to do a DNA analysis of the ink to discover that it was some smut that was used in the area, that dark black smut, you know, from a fire. And it was also mixed with uh, uh, sodium and uh, one other component, and they knew that it came from the Dead Sea because it matched the exact spectrum. So the water from the Dead Sea was used in the process of making the ink, and the ink was made there on skins of animals from there, pottery from there as well. But, but let, me, let me clarify, not every scroll had those signature markings on there, and those are the ones... Right, right. So, but they're, they're not all from that area. That's going to be my point. Because the question we're trying to ask is, who wrote them and how did they get there? And I think that's going to be interesting, as I tell you. Well, that's the question. Why were they hidden? Uh, it contains just the Old Testament. Because that's all it was found was Old Testament manuscripts. One of the theories is, okay, how did these scrolls get there? One is that it was a possible a sect of Judaism that didn't agree with temple worship over in Jerusalem, just went over to the backside of the desert, which is about an eight to ten hour walk, established a community there in Qumran, and began to practice their own way of Judaism. And that practice... Uh, has was actually written in some of the scrolls about life and how and what they do there as uh, these people who live in this area, okay? So they wrote about their life. Now the problem is is that you have some scrolls, pots, jars, and everything that are dedicated to right there. Then you have scrolls that don't seem to fit that they were written there, but are in pots sealed up that were made there so the question is is how did they get there well one of the theories is that 
these people did that. Another theory is, is it was a sect of early Christianity, and they went over there, and they're the ones who did that. But there's a third view of how those got there, and that's, that's kind of the view I hold to, and I'll, I'll explain that to you in just a little bit. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Pot shards? Uh-huh. No, the fragments. Fragments? That they took, uh, they built it. Mm-hmm. Did they also run that through some computer to try to piece it back together? Uh, yeah, you can, that, that is some of it, but because some of the writing is so faint and hard, it you don't realize how much is resting on the guy who's got his hand on the mouse and is looking at a screen trying to figure out how this would all go together. It's pretty challenging. But what they do is they take one good manuscript that they have, and they know because of these fragments, they're probably from that same book of the Bible. They're able to, by computer, isolate just exactly where that little scrap of text might be found. And it might be found in... Like, if it's the word Lord, you know, Adonai, um, good luck with that because that's found throughout the Old Testament. So how do you determine what book that went to, especially when there's so many books that contain the word Adonai? But then when you find other words that are more unique to a book of the Bible, um, you're able to isolate and be able to say, okay, it could be one of these four books, and then they have to put them together. And it's a time-staking you, you just can't believe it. In 1950s, Father DeVoe, who was a Roman Catholic uh, priest, part of a monastic uh, life and part of a community, he and seven other Catholic priests, scholars, were uh, assigned to first collect and to record and to actually do research on the Dead Sea Scrolls. When you think of seven guys who have to unwrap these fragments and try to figure out a puzzle. Do you realize how long that would take them to do that? It's just not enough people. And so the information of the Dead Sea Scrolls is kind of slow in coming out because of the technology. Now with our technology, we're able to get at it quicker, do more research. And as we've been able to do more research and discovery, the whole idea and what is this scroll from and where is it from has become more clear and, and more understandable these days. But Father DeVoe, a, a good godly man, um, he is reading his own life experience back into the Dead Sea Scrolls in terms of where he thinks they came from and who these people in Qumran were. He, he, he views them as a religious community uh, who is there to do one thing, and that is to preserve Old Testament scripture and their way, their monastic way of life. And what we're going to find out is that is partially true, but it is not all true. So let me move on here a little bit. Uh, so here's where they find them hidden inside the cave. And then during the Six-Day War, are you familiar with the Six-Day War? Uh, in 1967, I was able to stay in a building uh, on top of Mount Zion, uh, uh, Institute of Holy Land Studies, and there was this big cable that ran through my room because my room was all solid rock, uh, Herodian stone going right through my room and across the Kidron Valley. That's the cable that when the is- Israeli soldiers were going over to take the temple mount, they would hook their ammunitions on there and slide it across to the other side to supply ammo. And eventually they took the whole temple mount area and the area of the temple and what is known today as the West Western Wall. So here he is, 40 years of delay in the publication, right? K4 fragments are in the Huntington Library at San Marino, California. And then for, uh, photographs of the K4 material to scholars has been given to us and so we're able to see them and it's in different locations in different places in 67 cave 11 scroll uh, damaged from improper storage ended up being in Kondo's home in Bethlehem he's the guy that um, originally bought them off the Bedouin people Um, the recovered scroll uh, named the temple scroll because of the unique description of a new temple that they were building or going to build so, and they confiscated and got those back from the guy. So, the temple scroll is the longest, right? 26 feet in length, which is pretty substantial. And the weight of it, as you can imagine, is pretty 
difficult. So if you have a book of the Bible like Isaiah 66 books, you, you know, 66 books is going to be pretty heavy duty and it's going to be um, rolled up like this, like a scroll. And so you can roll a scroll up like a roll of toilet paper or paper towels that just goes like this. Or you can start at one end and this end and then meet in the middle. That's what they usually do. And then if they're going to read, they roll it out left or right to be able to read the various texts. So in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus enters into the temple and the scroll of Isaiah is given to him, he rolls it open to the place of Isaiah chapter 61 and he begins to read. Does anybody know what he says? I've been sent by the Lord, right, to heal the lame. I've been sent to give eyesight to the blind. And this is the favorable year of the Lord. And then he says something shocking. He says, today, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. And of course, they're all just astounded. But that's what he did. He took this scroll. He unrolled the scroll to the place of Isaiah. And he began to read. Quite remarkable. The outside places of these scrolls so as the scroll is being rolled up the parts that are exposed to the exterior could actually be more worn out and so they kind of find that as they unfurl these things and look at them there are worn out sections but it's the same thing later on with what we call codexes or manuscripts that we find today uh, like codex sinaiticus and vaticanus that we found um, it's not the actual edges of the scrolls. These are codexes, and a codex is a book. But when you go to turn a page in the book, how many of you do this? And as they've gone through those scrolls, they've actually found out worn out places here on the corner <laughs> with a, where the guy licked his finger and turned the page. So it's amazing the stuff they can find today when they're actually uh, looking for today's new technology. So they went in and they did excavation of the whole area. Um, they did seismic testing, ground penetration radar, drilling to find any anomalies, anything like this, and then uh, excavation to go down below even further looking for things because you got to remember something brutal happened here. Uh, does anybody know what happened in Israel in 70 AD? The Romans came in and laid siege of the city. So if you look at your Roman empires, you have Nero who offs himself in 68. You have Galba who comes to power and he's just there for four to six months. Then you have Ortho. You know him because later on he invented the mattress, the Ortho mattress. And uh, he comes to power for a short time and then Vespasian comes to power. But Vespasian is not liked by the Roman Senate. And so Vestilium is another Roman uh, general ends up taking his place and his son is Titus and he says to his boy finish what I've started in Israel wipe them all out because of the rebellion that took place in 67 68 all the way through through 70 AD and so they come through and they literally wipe the place out I mean they just start at the top and work their way down don't go directly into Jerusalem swing around the other way come up from behind and then they actually come into Jerusalem but that's going to be a real interesting story so here's Jerusalem and just so you can see some of the modern day uh, places that are all around there now what religion is Lebanon how about how about Syria Iraq Jordan Egypt Muslim, yeah, Islam. So they're all surrounded by this little group of Jews on the inside, which is quite unique. So there's Qumran. Whoops, there's Qumran right there next to the Dead Sea. So here's some of the fragmentation. Now this is Greek. This is Koine Greek. It's from Cave 7. You can see what the how they put it together. So it's kind of a jigsaw puzzle. You say, well, where are the pieces? Well, the, the thing is, is that they have this as a complete manuscript, and so they're able to take these pieces and know where they go. That makes sense? So it would be like if I had a jigsaw puzzle, big picture, and then I had five or six pieces over here. I could take those pictures, look at the color, and figure out what, where they go on the picture and set it on top of the box. 
They may not connect because I'm missing all the connectors, but I can tell what they are. That's kind of what they do. Different caves, this was the site uh, where they believed everything was uh, actually uh, how it was found in the, in the lower uh, corner, which would be your lower right-hand corner, would be the scriptorium. That's where they believe they did that. Now, uh, what is really interesting is Titus, who begins this siege of Jerusalem. So he surrounds the city because he, he doesn't want to lose men uh, taking the city. The hardest thing to do in battle is to take a city because you've got to go room by room, floor by floor, and you have to clear it. I had the privilege of being invited up to um, Camp Roberts. They had a clergy day, of all things. This was 20 years ago. And uh, they took us in there, and they showed us how the military clears a room. You walk, four guys go into a room. One takes high, one takes low, one takes the corners. So they walk in with their guns pointing all different directions to enter safely into the room. Well, that's the hardest thing to do because you're exposing yourself to fire. So what the General Titus decided to do was let's just get a siege on it. Now, there was a guy by the name of Josephus. You ever heard of his name, Josephus? Josephus was a scholar, but he was also a general who defended a city called Aleppo. And uh, he did a brilliant job of holding out the Romans. Now, you think when that was all said and done and the Romans capture him, they're going to like off him. You know, you, you've caused us a lot. No, that's not how the Romans thought. They said, your understanding of warfare is so great. We're going to take you with us. You're going to become one of us. That was the strength of the Roman Empire as they amalgamated other strengths from other people and put it into their system. And they said, you're going to now go ahead of us to all these cities and tell them what we did to your city and that we're going to do the same to them if they don't surrender. So when they come to Jerusalem, Josephus goes in there to tell them what the Roman Empire is going to do to them, going to ultimately destroy them. And he begs them to surrender. Surrender. Don't, don't go any further. They're going to destroy you. Well, these Jews are pretty hard-headed. They say no. But the other interesting thing about it is Josephus is also a writer. He's also a historian. So what he says in Jerusalem and what he does is recorded in the works of Josephus. So we kind of know what happened in the siege of Jerusalem. It got so bad that actually, it was gross to think about it, but several people had resulted to cannibalism and were eating their children. So you can, you can get an idea of how the scarcity of food and water was. But here's the interesting part, and this is where my thesis comes in that there is underneath of Jerusalem a vast system of tunnels that were used for waste, drainage. And during this siege, what we know is that some people went down the sewer, out across the Kidron Valley, past the Mount of Olives, and we believe walked nine hours by night to Qumran. That's how they escaped. Well, that's going to give you temporary relief because after they siege Jerusalem, they're going to come to Qumran and some Jews are going to escape there and they're going to go down south to Masada. And when they get to Masada, the Romans are just going to build a giant rampart going all the way up. It's going to take them a long time to do that. But then they're just going to go to the top of the city and destroy everything. So here's what I believe took place. These Jews living in Jerusalem now have to flee. What do you think their most valuable possession would have been? Word of God. The scrolls. That to them would have been the most valuable thing. So I believe that these Old Testament scrolls were not all copied in Qumran, but rather were taken in protection through the night over to Qumran. When they got there, Qumran had is also a pottery making facility, put the scrolls in the pottery, sealed the top of them, and hid them in various caves to be discovered or to come back at a later time to get them. That's pretty amazing to think about. Now, part of the reason we know that to be true 
is because they've discovered ceremonial cups. And these ceremonial cups, if you were to look at it, just looks like a cup with a little striation on it, a pottery cup. They've been able to subject those cups that they found in Jerusalem to ultraviolet light and multi-light spectrums to be actually able to read the writing. And it was on the cups they found the word Adonai, I shall return. Interesting, Lord, I will return. And the only other place that those cups are found is in Qumran. That's it. So I believe that there was a group of people, we know that there was people who were in charge of protecting the scrolls, that those people, their job in protecting of the scrolls meant to get out of there through the tunnel, through the waste system, the drainage, to go across the Kidron Valley to Qumran, put them in jars, lock them up. Now, that word Adonai in code that's hard to read is also found on some of the manuscripts, and not only on the manuscripts, the cups as well. Now, we know that there were Essenes in Jerusalem. We know that monastic order was there. And so as they are there, how did the cups get over to Qumran? Well, I think they came over with the scrolls, sealed them in jars to protect them. So some of the scrolls of the 931 scrolls, a third of them are about life there in Qumran, but the other third are biblical scrolls that more than likely came from Jerusalem. That's pretty interesting when you stop and think about it. Because remember in Isaiah chapter uh, 61, the New Testament reference, Luke chapter 4, when Jesus stands up in the temple and he reads the scroll, it could be, I, we have no way of proving it, but it could be that one of the scrolls that Jesus read was one of these scrolls that we found in Qumran. Because these scrolls were written 250 B.C. or B.C.E. all the way up to 78 or 68 A.D. or C.E., common air. That's the span. We've also found coins in the tunnel, and none of those coins go past the date of 70 A.D., both here and at Qumran. So whatever happened in 70 A.D. was a total destruction of Israel, escape with the scrolls, flee to Qumran. There in Qumran, these people are going to help them. These Essenes are going to help them, putting the scrolls in the jars, sealing them up and hiding them. Now, originally, the thought was these Essenes themselves copied all the scroll work and did it. But it doesn't seem to fit because the ink from some of these scrolls doesn't match what the other ink is. However, all the pottery that they found that the scrolls were put in are from that area of Qumran. And what is interesting about that pottery is we can actually tell that it's from there. But another reason why we do not believe that the people in Qumran, the Essenes, wrote all these scrolls is because Jewish practice was is that when you were writing, I'll find a, let me just, uh, So here's some of the coinage that they found, right? All in the first century. Some of the pottery, different shapes, different sizes. They've done DNA analysis on it. You can see I got a lot of slides here. This is what it was like when they would hide them in the scrolls. This is some of the jars with the actual copper that is in there. These are the ink wells that they discovered. But what is so fascinating about all of this is that it continues to point to the fact that these Essenes who were copying the scrolls couldn't have done the Old Testament scrolls. Why? Because when a Jew, and they were Jewish, would write the Old Testament and they came to the word Lord or God, they would go take a bath, a ceremonial bath. And they would come back and then write the word Adonai, Yahweh, God, 
And then they would continue writing when they came to the word God again. They would go take a ceremonial bath. Come, can you imagine how long that would take? They discovered 15 or 16 mikvahs there. A mikvah is a ceremonial bath. And they said, okay, the, all these baths here are now being used by Jews to take a bath because they're writing Old Testament scripture. What they discover through greater archaeological archaeology and going deeper, that 15 of those baths were not ceremonial baths, but they were containing cisterns of water for which they actually had pottery uh, sediment in the bottom of them. In other words, these were used to make pottery, not take a ceremonial bath. There was only one mikvah found there, what is a ceremonial bath. The others are all pottery used to make pottery, water supply, clay, getting it wet, beginning the process of making pottery. So they know now, and the modern day thinking now is simply this, and there's a really great professor out of UCLA who's an archeological uh, guy, an archeologist, basically agrees, and many of the people now have come to the agreement that these are probably Jewish scrolls from Jerusalem itself. So think about that. We have scrolls dating all the way back to the time of Christ. Before that, the closest scroll we had was at the very first turn of the millennium, 1000 AD. Then they've done comparison between the scrolls found in 1000 AD and the Dead Sea Scrolls that are another 1,000 years old, and they compare them to see if there's any errors. 95% accurate. The other 5% are just simply different misspellings, punctuation, a word got dropped. So you're talking virtually identical over a thousand year period, which helps us understand the veracity and the truth of scripture that God's word is providentially preserved for us. And that the very Bible, the very word of God that you have can be trusted because it's been handed down through the ages and it is God's word. They do this all the time. We have over 5,000 New Testament manuscripts and as they compare them, there is like a 98% total agreement with all of those manuscripts. They were found in different areas around the globe as they discovered them, but it dry climate like this in Qumran or in North Africa, Alexandria and places like that that's a desert type is the best preservation for these manuscripts. So it's quite fascinating. Uh, here's a little map of the, where they think the scriptorium worked. Here's a, how they envisioned the original building was a two-story building. And uh, it's, it's fascinating how they put all this together. What I'm looking for is a fragment. Here we go. Hang on. Okay, so here is Yahweh, and you can see how many times they would have had to take a bath. Right? Now, you'll also note that this is paleo, and therefore, when you look at it, the one on the um, right-hand side is the manuscript, the one on the left-hand side is blown up so you can see the actual word. And if I was to hold to you modern-day Hebrew, the word Yahweh, and you were to look at this, you were to go, how'd they get that out of that? Well, it's the same word, just a different alphabet, same language. So, quite remarkable find, quite interesting. Um, here's what they found. Jewish literature, apocryphal, pseudopigrapha writings, 400 plus manuscripts, sectarian texts that were used by the people, the Essenes, about 200 of them, and then about 200 plus manuscripts of the Bible. Let me give you another picture of it. So these are some of the scrolls from Psalm. This is some of the scrolls from the book of Samuel. So also have to remember, you and I have First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, that's not how they did it. It was just the book of Kings, the book of Samuel. Ezra and Nehemiah, one book. So where we break them up, they tend to put them all together. Okay, guys, questions?
No, no, there's been no doctrinal thing that's come up that says, oh my gosh, you know, there's this one joke where this Catholic priest goes down into the basement and he finds some old scrolls and he reads them and he comes up from the basement and he starts yelling at all of his fellows and he said, oh no, the word is celebrate. <laughs> Not celibate, get it? <laughs> no, no major doctrine has been overturned because of it. Yes. Well, they don't. That's the whole point. They just, yeah, they don't believe it. I mean, their heart is stiffened and cold. Why, why is it that your neighbor next to you or your friend rejects Jesus Christ as Savior? They have the Word of God. They've been witness to. That's what the Scripture says. Their eyes have been blinded. They cannot see Jesus. Yeah, Glenn. Yeah. When they come to Isaiah, they do not read part of the talks about Jesus. And they just skip over 53. 53. Yeah, 53. Just do not, does not I, did, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Now, if you want to do something that's interesting, you, ever, you know who Ben Shapiro is? Okay, so he's pretty common, really bright, young Jewish man. Uh, John MacArthur, a pastor at Grace Community Church, did, uh, Ben Sapiro asked him on his program, and John sat there for 45 minutes with Ben going through Isaiah 53. You want to talk about a powerful interview. The gospel was just so present and relevant, and Ben was just kind of sitting there mystified. You, would, you, you, would, you, you come to the end of the interview, and you go, why doesn't that guy just fall down on his face and receive Christ? It's just a hardness in some people's heart. They don't see the truth. Sad, but it's true. Yeah. You were saying, uh, well, uh, I was say, the scrolls have Genesis through the uh, minor prophets? Through, through the whole Old Testament, except the book of Esther. Yeah, but they're individual scrolls. They don't have one massive, you know, roll of paper the size that a newspaper company would use. It'd be too impractical. Yeah. Uh, Gordon, then I'll come. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, many of them were found intact. Yeah, the whole lot book of Isaiah found intact and others intact. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've not been there. I want to go there someday. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. Is it a copy of the dead? Yeah. 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 What, what's on display is a copy too. If you go down in the basement, you, you remember the Helms Bakery truck when he would come, and and he would, you know, I I always spent my lunch money at the Helms Bakery truck before I got to school. But the guy would open a box and he would slide that box out of the back of his truck and it was all filled with donuts, you know. Well, that's what they have for this Isaiah scroll. It's it's all in a uh, specially climate controlled room and they open it up and it just goes. I tried to get in the room, but I, I they wouldn't allow me. And then they have tissue paper like over the top of it and then they just lean it over and you can actually see it. So, but if you see anybody handling it, they'll be wearing gloves, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Need to wind it up. Thank you, guys. One last question. Okay. Did I bore you all to death? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let me say this. So normally we're going to be back on schedule except for the end of this month because the women have a retreat and they're going to be using this building. So uh, our next systematic theology will be September yes. 10th. 
stand by, they're looking. And we're going to study the doctrine of salvation. It'll be the 10th, 10th of September. Another big breakfast. Another big breakfast, 7 o'clock right here. And, and you're going to find this interesting because starting in, in the order of salvation, you start off with the very first thing, and that's the decree of God, the decree of election. And so if you've ever been confused about election or anything like that, um, come. <laughs> You'll be more confused. Let me pray. Father in heaven, thanks for your word. Thanks for this day we have together. Bless us as we gather tomorrow to worship in our respective places. Father, we thank you for your word that's providentially preserved for us. As the psalmist has said, you have kept your word. You have preserved it from this generation forever. And we can truly trust it. Thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings, guys.